special day. So we are uh, continuing uh, this series called Shape. And remember the idea, uh, last week we started this idea of shape, uh, makes up five things, our, our unique shape, our spiritual gifts, our heart, our abilities, our personality, and our experiences. Uh, 20 something years ago, uh, Rick Warren came up with this as just a way uh, to ultimately say, hey, here how, here's how God has uniquely shaped you to accomplish his mission and his will in order to bring his kingdom. And so we're walking through this together as a church. Ultimately, we want to weed this into our service teams and our discipleship and understanding of how to equip you guys uh, to do that if you're a Christ follower. If you're not a Christ follower and you're here today, we are so glad you're checking things out. And we hope you hear the gospel, see the gospel, and experience the gospel as you hang out at church. And so one of the things we want you guys to hear is this, is that you are not one in a million. You're one in 7.8 billion. All right, that God has uniquely created you. Uh, and remember, God is not a God of copies, but he is a God of masterpieces, that each one of us is uniquely gifted. And as we talk about those five things, understanding that he does not want you to be a carbon copy of the world. And, and we talked about this last week of the idea, of, look, God has shaped you and that he has created a whole that just goes, you know what, here is where you fit. All right. That, that when we are living out our, and using our spiritual gifts and our hearts and our passions, our abilities, our personality and our experiences, it's the idea that, man, we are in the place where God wants us to work. And things work really well when we're living that out. And we're bringing his kingdom and we're finding joy and, and we're doing things that we're good at. But when I can get the shape out, there we go. And we try to look at someone else and go, man, I wish I had their abilities. Man, I wish I had their experiences. Man, if I just had their spiritual gifts, I would be happy. And God said, no, 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 no. You're one in one in 7.8 billion. I have uniquely created you to fit in this way in which you're going to find happiness. You're going to find satisfaction. You're going to find what it looks like to be complete in me, not in the world. So stop looking for the world to find your shape. Don't tell you the world to say this is where your value is. Don't find that in the world. It's not in money, sex, and power because that's what the world tells us. All right, the idea of going, no, I have uniquely shaped you in a way that you are going to be completed. Now, too often, we, we don't want to live out our, our unique masterpiece. We, we want somebody else's life. You know, it's one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. All right, the idea that we want what someone else has when God says, no, I have given you everything you need to live out your unique shape. The question is, are you listening? The question is, have you tapped into the Lord? Have you, have you asked him, hey, hey, God, how have you made me me? That's what we want to talk about today. Uh, so one of the things that, that we say is that beauty's in the eye of the beholder, and I have some masterpieces that I consider masterpieces because I'm the beauty of this beholder. And so here's the thing is that several years ago, I started collecting um, vintage Clemson football programs. And so as I did that, one of the things I, I, I was pulled toward was because I like design and I like art is um, in the late 60s, uh, there was this guy named Phil Neal. And he started doing uh, artwork for the cover of programs that look something like this. And so actually, Phil Neal is an Auburn guy, but he did some side hustles for Clemson, and he created Uncle Clem, all right? So Uncle Clem is on the cover of some very unique, uh, original, uh, hand-drawn artwork. Now, the thing is, I've started collecting these, and, and they're kind of like Tom and Jerry, so they're not politically correct, so, so people get harmed in these. Uh, here is a Gamecock getting harmed, which we, we applaud as Clemson Tigers. Uh, and so South Carolina is getting there. And then I've got another Georgia one where uh, the Georgia Bulldog is about to get run over by Uncle Clem. And so uh, they are very uh, humorous in, in my picture. But I, I pay more money than a dollar that they were bit over 60 years ago. If you went to a game, you paid a dollar for this. But I could, I could pay not much more than a dollar if I wanted copies. But here's the thing. I don't want copies. I want originals. The reason why I want originals is because originals are more valuable. Why are originals more valuable? Because they're limited. There are not many of these left around that are sitting around 60 years ago that someone decided to keep. So this is worth more money than a copy. Why? Because copies are a dime a dozen. But unique originals, they're worth a whole lot more. And this is what God says to us. He says, hey, I didn't create you guys to be carbon copies. I didn't just create, uh, take a cookie cutter idea of going, hey, I want you, 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 you to all look alike. He says, I want originals because they're worth more. They're valuable and he breathed life into us. So let's not settle for just dime a dozen copies, but let's be originals. And that's the heartbeat of this shape series is they go, hey, what's it like for me to be an original that's limited in, it, in its production? What's it look like for me to be one in a billion? 
versus the idea that I just look like everybody else and talk like everybody else and vote like everybody else. And the idea of going, hey, what's it like for to seek the Lord out and find that unique shape? Last week, we looked at the S, which is spiritual gifts. And a lot of you guys took your spiritual gifts surveys, and we said it's just not about, just not about discovering the, the idea that you have a test, but that you test those and you experiment with those and you ask other people about those. It was cool to hear just how unique even our Capstone Church family is. Because ultimately, we, every church is unique in its shape. Because as Romans 12 tells us, Paul says, look, every church is one body, once, one body, but the same spirit, but unique gifts. That what we have, other churches don't have, because each one of us make up a unique shape. And so it's awesome to hear your spiritual gifts and how the Lord begins to go, hey, hey, here's how I want to use your gifts. It's a special gift, not a natural gift, but a, a supernatural gift that when we become Christ followers, that we receive. He says, hey, it's not for your glory, but for mine. And so as we talked about architecture and the idea of going function follows form in architecture, and we said it's the opposite when it comes to our shape is that our form gives us our function. That when we figure out what that shape is, we figure out what that spiritual gift is, now it tells us our function. Now it tells us what we can do in the church. It, it tells us how we can be missionaries where we work, live, and play. It, it tells us how we are to reflect the goodness of the Lord when we figure out our form. It tells us what our function is. So as we walk that out today, we're, we're in the second part. So we got S, which is spiritual gifts, and then H is heart, all right? So this is not, by chance, it's Mother's Day on heart, all right? So the idea that we're going to talk about our hearts and our interests and our passions and, and how God created us. And understand that he created us out of importance, and, and our hearts are important physically. If our heart stops, what happens? We stop, all right? So physically, our hearts are important. Our hearts are important emotionally and spiritually as well. God knew the importance of our hearts. Scripture tells this about our hearts in Proverbs 27, 19. It says, as a face is reflected in water, so, is the, so the heart reflects the person. So our hearts reflect us. Our hearts are, they make up our interests, our passions, our desires. And here's the thing, God created our heart and he put them inside of us. Let me say this. Our hearts make us us, all right? all right? You can write it down this way. Your heart makes you, you. Your heart makes you, you. And the thing is, is that God has hardwired that into you. That he has hardwired that into you of understanding what it looks like because your heart motivates you. Your heart drives you. Your heart is the one that pushes you. It affects what you say. It affects what you do. It affects what you feel. Your heart is the center of everything. Last week we said that we were unique, that we, every one of us have a unique thumbprint, that we all have a unique voice print, that uh, we, me and Luke have started watching some of the Mission Impossibles, and that your retina has a unique retina to get you into secret doors that you're not supposed to get into. But we all have that unique, and I didn't know this, so I started studying the heart. But you know, I didn't know this. That every heart has a unique beat. That, is spent, that depending on the size of your heart and the shape of your heart, you have a unique heartbeat. You're not one in a million. You're one in 7.8 billion. It's almost like God knew what he was doing. He didn't create carbon copies. He made unique originals that have value because there's no one else like you. That he has given you this heart, but just not... Just not physically, but also emotionally and spiritually. Here's the thing. Why would God do that? That sounds complicated. But our God's a creative God. Because if we all like the same things and all love the same things, and we all have the same passions, if we all love to clean the houses, but no one loved to build the houses, we wouldn't have houses to clean. All right? Or we all love to drive cars, but no one loved to work on cars, then guess what? We wouldn't have any cars to drive. That we all have different loves to accomplish all the things that God wants to accomplish here on planet Earth. Every one of our loves intertwines to, to bless each other and to glorify the Lord. All right? So how many people just don't like dogs, but they love dogs? All right, let's see your hands. Let's see your hands. Not that many dogs. There we go. Getting honest. Here we go. It's okay to raise your hand. All right. If we're not charismatic right now, just, just taking a poll. <laughs> Some of y'all felt uncomfortable with that, with that joke. All right. How many of you love cats? All right. All right. We're gonna, we'll pray for you. We'll put you on the prayer list. All right. You know, dog spelled backwards spells God. Cat's devil. All right. So just, 
If cats were bigger than you, they would eat you. Do y'all understand that? <laughs> cats were bigger than you, they would eat you. All right, so, all right, so we got dog lovers and we got cat lovers. All right, how many people love football? You just love it. Put your hands up. All right, good job. All right, how many of you, if you never saw another football game in your life, you'd be satisfied? All right, we'll add you to the prayer list as well. All right. <laughs> All right, how many of you love art? Let's see, you love art, you love to create. Right, how many of you love music? All right, you begin, you're beginning to see how many different people love different things, and that's okay, you know why? Because God uniquely created us to love different things. There are passions and interests in our hearts. Philippians 2.12 says this, 2.13. It says, it is God who produces in you. Hear that. It is God who produces in you the desires and actions that please him. So the understanding of God puts those desires in your heart in order to please him. So it's kind of like me as an earthly father. If there's something I love and one of my boys picks up one of the things that I love and I see them live that out, that makes me a happy dad. Because he's picking up one of the passions that I put in him because he's been imitating and copying me. Our heavenly father's the same way. That when he puts a passion in you, when he hardwires you for that interest and that love and he sees you, it pleases him that you find joy in that. Now, remember, it's about pleasing the Lord because here's one of the things that we like to do, especially in American culture. We like to take good things and we make them God things. That's called an idol. So God is meant to be on the pedestal. He is the one we to worship. In our DNA, he created us to worship. We've had an entire series about that. But the idea that God is on the pedestal. And there, and there are many good things he has given us to find joy and pleasure and to please him. But the moment we take that God and take, take God off of there and go, okay, God, you're not as important as football or my dog or my kids or money or power. And I put those good things and I put them on that pedestal. They become God things. Ultimately, they become idols. God has not given us passions to worship them. They are a way that we can worship him. All right? He has not given us passions to worship them. He has given us passions in order to worship him. So how can we use our passions and our interests in order to bring glory to him? Now, you might be like, well, how do I figure out what my passion and shape is? What does that look like? So here's, here, here's what you ask. It's simply this. Is what do, I, what, what do I enjoy doing and what am I good at? So fill in the blank. I am good at it and I enjoy it. Whoa, 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 well, you talk all about this, you got to sacrifice to yourself, and you got to die to yourself and live for Jesus, and you got to die. Well, how can I enjoy something and be good at it? Always just be humble in Jesus? Yeah. But here's the thing, that when you begin to live out your passions and your heart and dying to yourself, going, you know what, I'm really good at something, but it's not for my glory for his, but I really enjoy doing it, but it's not about my fame, but about his, man, I find joy in that. And you know what? It's not, just not that I find joy in it. It means I'm really good at it. So you know what? It's not about me trying to be someone else, but the idea of going, hey, here's how God has put a passion in my heart, and here's how I am going to begin to bring him glory through it, and here's the thing. I'm really good at it. Because if we have passions and you're not really good at it, it's probably not a passion, all right? It's called butchering something, all right? But the idea of going, hey, here's something that I'm good at. And here's how I'm going to bring glory to that. Because here's the thing. John 15 tells us this. He says, you are to be fruitful, that you're to bear fruit, which means you should be effective, which means you should be productive, which means you should be doing things that bring you joy. And when, you become, when you're effective, that means you're good at it. And that's okay, because ultimately a confidence isn't in what I do, it's what Christ has done for me. So it's not the idea that I'm puffing up myself with pride. It's the idea of going, man, God has given me this passion, and this is for his glory. Again, it brings you joy, and you find, and it brings God glory. There are just some things that you're good at, and you enjoy. All right, I enjoy yard work. Some of you cuss every time you have to go out and cut the grass, all right? You just hate it, all right? It's like, ah, I love it. Like, I, I shape my day around going out and doing that. All right, people drive past my house. I put out mulch yesterday, and I'm going to not lie to you. It looks good, all right? Man, I, wet, I weeded the beds. I took the edge around it. It looks sharp, all right? The Bermuda's starting to come up, getting the weeds out of there, put some fresh mulch down. It looks good. I love being outside. I love working. It fills me up, all right? I enjoy doing it, and I'm good at it. But again, it's not the idea that it's about me. It's the idea that God has given me life, and he has created for the earth. And I want to be out there in it and give him glory. And guess what? Worship through it, not worship it. 
And so the idea that it fills me up and energizes me. So what are you good at? What are you good at? And what brings you joy? Jesus says it like this in Matthew 5. He says, let your light shine. Let people see what you do and do it well. In word and deed, that people would praise the Lord for what you're doing. Noticing they're not praising you. They're praising the Lord for what you are doing. Why? Because you enjoy it and you love it. And the Lord fills up your cup through it. And you're good at it. Man, whether it's encouraging people and blessing people, whether it's serving people, whatever it may be, the idea of going, hey, man, you've seen people come up to you and go, man, I have never seen anyone do the way that you do it and do it in such a loving way. Things that I don't really want to do, you love doing it and you're good at it and that's okay. Don't run away from your shape because you go, man, I'm really good at that. No, embrace it because God wants to use that. Matthew 12 says this. Again, it's it's an idea about hearts, that our hearts are produced that fruit, how effective are we? Matthew 12, 33 and 34. Either make the good tree and its good fruit good or make the tree bad and its, its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit, by what it produces, whether there's joy or whether there's hate. It says this, you brood of vipers. He's talking about religious leaders. He's talking about church people there. He says, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So our heart is a reflection. We we saw that in Proverbs. It's a reflection of us. And so if we are full of negativity, if we're full of uh, of hate, and we're full of just the idea of just, it's it's woe is me, guess what that comes out of? That comes out of us. And people don't look at us and give God glory. They look at us and go, man, they are a stick in the mud. Who invited Eeyore to this party? Why? Because the reflection of our heart is we... We're looking and there's just something in our heart that's not right. Why? Because if our heart's not right, then it sets the whole thing off. But if we're good and we begin to encourage people and we begin to go, hey, man, how it's not an obstacle but an opportunity. Man, well, here, here's the ways that we can bring the Lord. Here, here's how we can share the gospel. Here's how we can have gospel conversations. Here, you know what? Yes, we are seeing the world get darker and darker and darker. But here's the opportunity for the church to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. Here's a way for, here's one of the things I'm passionate about. And here's how God's going to use me in that. That's a reflection of the heart. So what is your heart reflective of? Now, here's the thing. We can be in good places, but I'm going to be real honest. Some church people are the least passionate people you will find. People go, I don't want to be a part of whatever that guy's got, because he is, he's no fun. He's boring. Can I tell you the most passionate people should be Christ followers? The most energetic people should be Christ followers? Why? Because we are not just living here on earth and, having, and ha- finding joy and we're good at what we do. It's just not that side of thing. It's that we have a heavenly father who sent Christ to die for us. He was perfect so we don't have to be. And we have an eternal home. Like if there's, if there's anyone who should be full of passion, it should be us. But many of us, we don't. And we're miserable. We're not following our dreams. There's no vision. We just kind of exist. So let's look at some heart stoppers that that really keep us from following our hearts. First is this, is disappointment. Number one, this is the number one heart stopper. We've all been there. Someone has hurt you. Someone has disappointed you. Someone has spoken into you that has not been positive. And so what happens when we get hurt? Disappointment fills us and we we go back into our shell. We we build a wall. We don't want to get hurt again. And that's where we live. We, we, we said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna risk anymore. I'm not gonna go out there anymore. I'm not gonna do that because I've been disappointed. She let me down. He let me down. They hurt me. But what does that look like in your life? It's just not that we exist because it's not healthy. We live for not getting hurt. We don't live for the king. We exist in order not to get hurt and we fail to ever live for the king. We live protecting ourselves instead of living out the passions that are in our heart. And so many times, that's where we live. Or, or, or we think about what others are going to say. Well, Walt, if I tell them my passions, I, I, they're going to laugh at me. Well, if I, if I tell them my passions, I've got to get vulnerable and I've got to go that whole other d- level. I, I don't want to be disappointed if someone laughs at me or they think I'm going to be a failure or I get vulnerable and, and, and they don't embrace that. Or, well, what if I, what if I try something and, and I, I jump and I fail? Can I tell you, if you try something and you fail, what that's called? Being normal. Being normal. If you don't fail at anything, then you're not risking anything. And if you're not risking anything, then you're not living. 
So we need to hear that as the church. Because too many of us as the church are playing safe. We're not going, you know what? Everything I have is the king's, it's not mine. So you know what? Let's go all in. Let's not live in fear of disappointment, which leads to our next one. Heart stoppers, which is fear. Anna spoke on this a couple, week, uh, a couple months ago. Parable of the talents, which ultimately was this, making the most of what has been given to us. The first two, they invested the, that what had been given to, they invested it. And guess what? There might have been business ventures that won and business ventures that lost, but no matter what, they went out and they risked it. And what did Jesus say? He says, it came back and says, well done, good and faithful servant. You didn't hide. You went out there. You did what you, you followed your heart. You followed your passion. You followed the command. You followed the obeying. Good job. The last one said, you know what? I, didn't, I feared what you would do to me if I lost your money, so I just buried it. And he calls him a wicked servant. Too many of us live in fear of the, of the what ifs. We, our hearts shrink. We fail to follow our passions. There's the what ifs. The what if happens. 12 years ago, Chris and I, we had those same what ifs. Laura and Betsy, we sat around a table. We said, what if? What if we moved to Fountain Inn and we quit our jobs and nobody comes to this church we start? What if everybody comes and they don't give any money? What if nobody cares that we're starting this new thing? All those what ifs were there. And can I tell you, all those what ifs were real, but our faith was bigger than our fears of the what ifs. Too many in the church live in the what ifs and we never follow our passions. So stop living in the fear of, well, what if I invite them to church and they say no? Obedience isn't if they come, the obedience is you doing it. Stop living in fear. Our passion to see a new work here in the city was greater than the fear of if it didn't work. What's God calling you to do? And Chris and I, we actually, we, we really joked about this this week because we were, we were having a conversation. We were like, how low did God have to get on the list to get to us? So these people said no. I got to the Bible. I'm running out of people. I guess we got to tap Walt and Chris. Because we, we, look, we're, we're unschooled, ordinary guys, all right? What you see is what you get. But I, 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 I do believe that we're people who told God no. Don't be that no that God is leaning in on you to follow your heart and passion. All right? God wants to use you. Next, heart stoppers, which is guilt. Too often, guilt stops us from doing amazing things from the, for the Lord. Here's the thing. Guilt drains us. Let me tell you a truth if you've never heard this. You can't be guilty and confident at the same time. You can't feel guilty and confident at the same time. Jesus came to remove your guilt. Romans 8.1. If you need to write it down, write it down. There is no condemnation in Jesus. He has, re- he has freed you from guilt. And guess what? Because he has freed us from guilt, our confidence is in Christ. So we need to remove the guilt of your past. Well, Walt, if you knew what I did in high school, or Walt, if you knew what I did in college, or Walt, if you knew about my first marriage, Walt, if you knew about all those things, there's no way God could use my passions in my heart for his kingdom. Can I tell you, Jesus has removed that guilt, past, present, and future? That our confidence is not even in what we do, it's what Christ has done. Somebody needs to hear that this morning because some of you are going, well, Walt, I I feel like God's put this on my heart, but I I can't do it because of what happened in my past. I'm here to tell you that Christ has removed the chains. And do you know what he set free? Your heart. The chains fall, you are free to follow your heart. What is it? What did we read? We read in Philippians 2. It is he gives you that passion for his pleasure. Let the guilt fall. Let the chains fall. And live in freedom to create, to live in freedom to dream, create, to do things for his glory. Don't live in fear of your guilt. Move forward. Because our identity isn't in what we do, good or bad. It's in whose we are. Let me say that again. Our identity is not in what we do, good or bad. Our identity is in whose we are, which is Christ. You're here today and don't know Christ. We want to tell you it is not about living in guilt. I know some of us grew up in churches that was all about guilt, 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 guilt. This is no, no, no. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Follow the passions of your heart for his glory. Last is heart stoppers, rejection. This is the most painful. I'm just going to be, some of, some of you heard you're not worth anything growing up. Some of you heard you won't amount to anything. 
Some of you heard you are, you're not good at, fill in the blank. And as your pastor, can I tell you, first of all, um, they lied to you and they were wrong. Because you are worth it and you can do it. The power of Christ dwells in us, whether it is digging out of that hole of our past whether it is pursuing that degree, whether it is following that dream, the idea that God has put that in us, all right? So don't understand the idea of rejection. Whether you heard that growing up, whether you heard that last week, or whether you heard that 10 years ago, the idea is this, is that don't allow that to, to, to limit your, your heart because God has created you. He has given you purpose, and when he puts that in your heart, he gives you the community to encourage you. He gives you the encouragement not to, not to fear rejection, but acceptance and how God is using that passion he has put in your heart. And so please hear that. Don't allow rejection to keep you. Stop seeking the approval of man. Find your unique shape in which God has put in your heart in order to bring him glory that God can rise you from the ashes, that God can rise you from your past, from your self-doubt, from your religious baggage, whatever it is that you've got with you that you need to push forward because ultimately he wants to accomplish amazing things through ordinary people like you and me. So again, the heart stoppers, disappointment, fear, guilt, rejection, they keep us from following our heart in so many ways. So probably about 20 years ago, I heard a message by a guy named Lou Giglio. It's called Designer Jeans. And the idea was this. It forever changed how I viewed my heart and even where I am today. That if I had not heard this message, I may not be here. But it was based on Colossians 3.23, and it just simply says this. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not men. At that point in my life, I was kind of on a fence of going, man, do I full go dive full in, into architecture or do I go into ministry? I didn't really know the path that God was really leading me in. And then I heard this message and ultimately Lou Giglio said this. He says, life is too short to simply exist. Follow your passions. Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, Whatever you do, whether you work at a church or an architecture firm or a construction site or a hospital or you're a student or you're on a college campus or you're living in a retirement community or you're in a school, wherever you're at, whatever you do, work at it as though you're working for the Lord and not man. And ultimately in that, the Lord gave me freedom to say, well, I don't really care whether you're an architect or you're a minister. It doesn't really matter to me. Whatever you do, do it for my glory. Do it for my glory. And also me, he said, look, if you want to design designer jeans, design, design great designer jeans that make the Lord look good in other people because they need to look good in their designer jeans, right? But the idea of going, hey, if you follow your passions, go and follow your heart, but do it for my kingdom and do it for my glory. Here's the thing. Too many of us as Christ followers, we're lazy, we're slack, we don't give all. We just kind of exist. We disobey Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart. At our job, we should be known as the most hardest working. We may not be the most talented, but we get there early and we stay late. At our job sites, people are like, man, I don't know what's there, but man, we can't. He's like the energizer bunny. We can't get them to stop. That every time she turns in a report, it's above and beyond. Why? Because what you are doing is not about the pleasing of man, but about pleasing the Lord. Whatever you do, do with all of your heart. So stop being, stop, no, I can't say that. Stop doing things halfway. I've learned how to filter my words as a preacher. But the idea is this, is that we have students and you just halfway do your work. We've got, we, we've got people who are in jobs and their job, they're just kind of, they're just kind of cruise on cruise control. They're not really giving glory to the Lord. And people go, man, I wish they would work harder. I wish they would put more into it. Again, it's not about, we're not earning God's love because we're working harder. It's this, it's that we should reflect the king. And so when we reflect the king, that means, man, we are putting our entire heart in whatever we do. And the Lord says, that's where you worship me. That's where I am blessed is when you put everything that you have in whatever you do. And so as we do that, how are you saying I'm not going to be slack Christian. I'm not going to be a lazy Christian. I'm not going to be apathetic because we do it in our jobs. We do it in our home. We do it in our community. 
That if anything, if anyone should care more about this community, it should be the church. If anyone should care more about families, it should be the church. If anyone should care about social justice, it should be the church. Yet we just watch things burn, and we don't want to do anything. And God has put a heart in some of you for for social justice, and someone that he's put a passion for families, and for some he's put in for veterans, and for some he's put for the homeless, and for some he's put in for foster care, and for some he's put in for the orphan. Whatever, or, what, whatever passion he's put into you, do it for his glory. Just don't sit and watch. So people, well, how did we end up in Haiti? I want to tell you this story. We've got the Haiti, go- it's, it's very deep and spiritual, and some of you know the story. So I was watching one of my passions, design and, and flipping stuff. And so I was watching Extreme Home Makeover, right? And I, I love it. And I just love watching that stuff. And there, were, there was a family who adopted two orphans from Haiti. And that's how we ended up in Haiti. Well, I've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars because you watched Extreme Home Makeover? Yes. And that's one of the reasons we're passionate about orphan care. It's one of the passions. Why? Because I watched a TV show. And you know what? God used that TV show. And I got excited about that, and God lit a fire in it. And guess what? We have, we have invested over a million, we've helped invest over a million dollars in Haiti because I watched a show that was about orphan care in a place called Haiti. What is it that you watch? What is it that you read? What is it you're a part of that lights a fire in your heart? So let me get three things really quick to follow our heart. One, listen to your heart. Some of us need to slow down and listen. We're in the, such a hurry to get to the next thing, we can't even listen to our hearts. So asking questions like this, what do I love to do? What is it that you love to do, all right? What's it that you love to do? And listen to your heart. What do you dream of doing? What do you dream of doing? What fantasizes me, which means this, what doesn't bore you? Some of you guys are sitting in jobs and you're bored out of your mind. I said, I've created you for more than this. What doesn't bore you? Where have I been if the most effective? Were you like, man, I was the most effective when I went to Haiti. Or man, I was the most effective when I began to read my word and God puts in your heart a passion for scripture. But God puts, so just begin to listen to your heart and go, man, here's where I was so effective. Here's where something I, I love doing and I was good at it. And God used me in a mighty way. Again, we serve out of design, not out of duty. We serve out of design, not out of duty. So the idea is this. It's not I have to, I get to. And we, we kind of say that at Capstone, and one of the things we want you to process, that if you're serving at Capstone, I pray that you go, man, it's my morning to serve, and I get to fill in the blank. Not, oh, it's Sunday morning, and it's my morning to serve. That's serving out of guilt. That's serving out of duty, not serving out of design. Some of you are sitting in this room, and you have amazing talents, and you're not serving. You're existing. What is it that God wants you to do? Listen to your heart. Next is the idea that we need to look at our options. All right, just because you love it doesn't mean, uh, doesn't mean you, you should just go and do it. Just because you love it doesn't mean you shouldn't take it under the, the, the banner of the Father's will. So just like this, Walt, I love Mexican and I am starting a Mexican restaurant. Now, that is not called Wisdom. That is called foolery, all right? Just because you love something, well, Walt, you told me passion, passion, passion. Hey, you seek the will of the Lord, but you also seek the will of the community. They're going, hey, hey, I know you started a restaurant. Can you tell me how hard it is? Or, or the idea of you love something, man, go talk to other people who do that. If you love something, read about it tons. If you love do it, go, tr- go travel and visit other people who are doing it. But the idea is this, is you need to have wisdom. Because too many of us, listen, too many of us make decisions in vacuums. You don't talk to other brothers and sisters. You make decisions based on what you want to do and not seek the wisdom of senior saints who are further along and more mature in their walk with the Lord. All right, so the idea of going, hey, what am I good at? And, and, and what, do I, what do you see me really enjoy? And it may be, man, you are, I came over and you made some killer enchiladas. And you know what? I support you. Let's get a truck and let's start a food truck. And let's go. Let's go for it right now. And that may be what they decide. But beginning to seek wisdom in that. So again, you got to look at your options and go, hey, what's the Lord really blessing me with? And then go, hey, what am I good at? Are you knowing someone? Go, hey, I've served with you and I've watched you and and you're really good at this. 
I think you love it. Hey, maybe you should begin to serve here. Or here, here could you be on this board? Or the idea of going, what is it that you, that you want to pursue the Lord in? All right, so there's. So it's the idea that we're going to listen to your heart. You're going to look at options. And the last is you're going to launch out in faith. Whatever you do, do it knowing that God is with you, that God is for you, and that God is cheering with you. He's cheering for you. So the idea that, that God, as you launch out in faith, that God is with you, God is for you, and he is cheering you on. Now, it doesn't always mean it's going to look like the way you thought. Twelve years ago, this is not what I thought church would look like. Didn't think we'd ever be under a steeple. We are. I didn't know that you, many of you existed. You're here. Because you know what? God knew 12 years ago, because he's God, is that God, he says, if you step out in faith, if you launch out in that, understanding if you follow your passion, if you follow your heart, and you re- I put on your heart to, to see a city transformed by the gospel, then guess what? I'm going to send resources. I'm going to send people. They're going to give you a building. Like all these things are going to be part of your, your church, Lord. He knew that. And so they understand that we're going to launch out in faith. And guess what? You may launch out in faith and you might fail. Guess what? That's okay because our identity isn't in whether we succeed or fail. Our identity is that we have the courage to step out in faith. Because our confidence isn't in what we do, whether we f- succeed or fail. Our confidence is in what Christ has already done. We're playing with house money. Because if anything else, if we fail at all these things and the economy crashes, and we do all this thing, guess what? In the end, we end up with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, worshiping him with all that we have. So launch out in faith. And just, here's the thing, whether you succeed or fail, here's what I guarantee you. I can't guarantee you whether you'll succeed or whether you fail. Here's what I will guarantee you. You will see God. If you have the courage to step out, to launch out in faith, you will see God. And man, when you see God, there's nothing else like it. Because you begin, okay, I can do more of this. It gives you more courage and more faith. You begin to bring others, you get other people to come with you. Because man, we got this amazing mission. Hey man, we got this amazing calling. So let's go do that together. All right, so here's your big idea. It's just simply this. Don't allow heart stoppers to keep you from living our shape. All right, don't allow those four things to keep you from doing that. Don't allow disappointment and fear and guilt and rejection to keep you from doing what God puts on your heart. But then follow your passions in order to bring his kingdom. How are you going to do that? How are you going to live that out? God has put a passion in you. He has given you a shape to live that out. So that was your big idea, but really this is your big idea, and this is from Scripture. If you don't have this underlined in your Bible, do it. If you need to highlight it on your app, get your app out. If you need to write this down, memorize it, it's Psalms 37.4. If I don't give you any other verse that tells you about the heart, it's just simply this. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. Your identity comes from the Lord. When you seek him first, all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow worry about itself. Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 6, 33 and 34. Life verse for me, changed my life. But he says, look, when you delight yourself in the Lord, what's he going to do? This is a promise. This is a promise of Scripture. And he will give you the desires of your heart. So seek him, delight in him, not in the world, not in the things of the world or chasing the American dream or all those things. But if you delight in him, it says he is faithful. He says he will give you the desires of your heart. So what does that look like in your life? What's that look like to follow the desires of your heart? So at 12 o'clock, just like last week, you're going to receive, if you have the app, you're going to get a notification of a survey to follow your heart. We're going to ask you some questions and ask you who you would serve and what passions you are. If you want to take that, we encourage you to do that. But it's another heart survey. So each one of these, we're going to give you a survey that follows just like we did just with uh, spiritual gifts. We're going to do that with the heart. But I pray that you begin to go, man, ask those questions. What do I enjoy doing? What am I good at? And maybe even ask, hey, what are those heart stoppers that keep me from following my heart? Psalms 37, 4. If you delight in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. Let's pray. God, we come to you now just full of thanks. And God, we come to you now thanking you for this unique shape that even our heartbeats are all different. You are such a creative God. And God, you are so big, and I pray we would not limit you in, 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 the, in what you have put on our hearts. That God, some of the most amazing things that have transformed this world came from a simple idea that came from the heart. We know that life change has been, even come out of this community, whether it is through the work we have in Haiti, or whether it is the idea of foster care and adoption, or whether it is having gospel conversations with our neighbor and people coming to know you, that life change happens when we get passionate about things that you've put in us.
So Lord, may we delight in you. May we seek you first. And God, when we do that, Lord, that you're going to, you promise to give us the desires of our hearts. So I pray that we would find those desires and we would lean into those desires. And we would, again, we would be complete in our shape. That we wouldn't want other people's passions. We wouldn't want other people's desires. But God, we would want the desires you have put in us. I thank you for the men and the women who have, you have used to plant those desires in our hearts. You've, you've given us moms who've, who've given us uh, desires and you've given us passions or you've given us grandfathers and grandmothers who invested in us and you've given us fathers who, who have shown us things. You've given us mentors and teachers who, who, have, who have put passions in us. I thank you for those men and women who invest in us and you use them. So may we continue their legacy. May we continue to use our gifts and our talents and our personalities and our abilities for you in your kingdom. May we delight in you. May you continue to be faithful and to give us desires of our hearts. In your son's holy name, amen. We are so glad that you joined us online this morning to worship with our Capstone family. Here was today's big idea. Don't allow heart stoppers to keep you from living our shape. Follow your passions in order to bring his kingdom. We all have something special in our hearts that God wants to use for his kingdom. The things you love, the things that get you excited were put there by God for God. If you have the Capstone app, you'll be receiving a notification in a few minutes about a heart survey. We encourage you to take this survey and then to begin to ask the Lord how you can use what you are passionate about for his glory. Again, thanks for watching online with us. We would love to connect with you via our social media platforms, our website, capstonechurch.net, or we would really love to see you in one of our future gatherings in person. You guys are sent out.